Hello, my name is Freddie Wynn. I am currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science at MIT and a resident physician in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Cell-Based Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And today I'd like to talk about some of the work I've been doing over the last few years, everything from the development of biochemical nanosensors to imaging to informatics to COVID-19 covalent plasma, all with an eye towards the development of diagnostics and therapies for clinical medicine. When I first started my postdoc, I really wanted to work on the development of new technologies that can help us uh, more quickly evaluate, effectively evaluate uh, the effectiveness of cancer therapies, in particular chemotherapies. Current cancer treatments really fall into three categories currently. The first is on the use of surgery for the primary removal of primary tumors. The second is on chemotherapy. The third is on radiation therapy. And the last two are really used to help shrink down the size of the tumor or the burn of the tumor, as well as to help potentially kill or remove any of the remaining remnants of the cancer cells after a surgical procedure in cancer patients. However, the current ways that we currently use to affect determine the effectiveness of these therapies is through imaging modalities such as CT MRI scans, and where we're looking for actual physical shrinkage of the tumor size and burn, which normally takes on a scale of weeks to months to happen. The other option is to do biopsies of the tumor tissue or the microenvironment. Uh, and that gives us some answers about what's happening on a molecular and cellular level for the cancer cell. But really we have the goal of trying to see, can we develop a new piece of technology that can more effectively determine the therapy efficacy of these cancer treatments and to decrease that time scale from weeks to months to really a matter of hours to days. And to be able to use that information to help guide the therapy dosing and frequency and at the same time to be able to decrease the patient exposure to adverse and toxic effects of subtherapeutic or ineffective treatments altogether. So as part of this research there was really two overarching questions. The first was to determine the drug delivery aspect. Did the drug actually get to the tumor site? Did it actually diffuse throughout the entire tumor microenvironment that's highly heterogeneous with fibrobotic tissue, for necrotic core tissue, with highly vascularized or lowly vascularized parts of the tissue? And then secondly, is it there at a highly high enough level or therapeutic enough level to make a difference? And then the second portion is really to now evaluate the efficacy of the drug now that it's there. You know, is it working on the cancer cells on a molecular and cellular level? And there was a review article a few years back that really called on um, some guiding principles on how to develop imaging technologies to better optimize molecular therapies. In particular, these technologies really have to figure out ways to better and sample tumors on a more comprehensive and frequent basis, how they can better help select patients for specific therapies, predict the therapeutic responses, as well as to find the most optimal drug dosing for those patients. So some of our technologies is focused on near infrared fluorophores, in particular single wall carbon nanotubes. And so I'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing to develop new form factors and new imaging systems to um, better enhance the usability of our near infrared sensors. And our near-infrared sensors are focused on two areas. One, as I mentioned before, is the development of sensors for um, chemotherapeutic drugs themselves. Uh, and here I've listed the most commonly used drugs for breast, brain, and pancreatic cancers. Um, and then second is to use uh, sensors to measure uh, reactive oxygen nitrogen species, in particular hydrogen peroxide and nitric oxide, as proxies for determining the, um, how the cancer cells are responding to that chemotherapeutic drug. So single wall carbon nanotubes uh, is basically a rolled roll up sheet of graphene and based on the pitch of, the, of how you roll up that sheet gives you the different chiralities of carbon nanotubes. Different chiralities get excited uh, at different uh, excitation wavelengths in the visible to near infrared range. They also emit light um, at uh, different um, emissions from the 900 to 1300 and then nanometers in the near infrared region. You can see each of these high spots correspond to a different chirality of carbon nanotubes. Um, and so you can really imagine the potential for multiplexing if you can associate a different chirality to being a different sensor that we're trying to detect. Um, the nice thing about carbon nanotubes is they don't photo bleach. They fluoresce in this near infrared window where it's most transparent for tissue um, in the sense that it's the least absorption from blood and from water in this range. Because of the size uh, of the carbon nanotubes, we get high resolution spatial information. And because of the reversible nature of these sensors, we also get dynamic real time type of information. The way we afford these uh, specificity and um, 
and sensitivity of the sensors is through a technique called corona phase molecular recognition or cough more. Uh, basically the way we do that is by you know, wrapping epiphilic molecules uh, around the hydrophobic carbon nanotube. And we can use everything from synthetic polymers to DNA sequences, RNA sequences, proteins, lipids, uh, to wrap around the carbon nanotube. And by forming this corona around it, uh, the hydrophilic components of that epiphilic molecule are facing outwards and are facing the biological environment. Once the analyte of interest interfaces or interacts with that surface wrapping around the carbon nanotube, it actually changes the conformation of how that wrapping sits in the carbon nanotube which induces a change in the electron cloud pi structure around the carbon nanotube. And that translates into the near infrared fluorescence changes that we can detect. And these can be intensity changes or wavelength shifts. In the prior times, the lab has developed sensors for hydrogen peroxide and for nitric oxide. It has demonstrated them both for in, in vitro applications as well as in vivo and small animals. We've also encapsulated these nanosensors into biocompatible hydrogels, which extends their viability to more than 400 days in vivo with no signs of inflammation or fluorescence degradation. Most of our optical imaging systems uses um, in-gas cameras, which are very expensive, need to be cooled down to minus 100 degrees Celsius, um, and, but they do give us very high sensitivity of detection. We've been exploring alternative methods such as Raspberry Pi cameras, which are low cost, can operate at room temperatures, but they do offer lower sensitivity in terms of detection. So we wanted to do, see if this was a feasible option. So in this very um, simplistic model using the Raspberry Pi imaging system, we have the laser here guided that illuminates the sample here with the carbon nanotubes, and then we're detecting the near infrared fluorescence at a 90 degree angle using the Raspberry Pi. You can see that even with this very simplistic model, we're still able to detect the near infrared fluorescence that's coming from the single wall carbon nanotube. We've also been developing hyperspectral and multispectral imaging systems, uh, which really is gonna help us enable the ability to perform multiplex assessing and to really improve the sensitivity and specificity um, of our sensing. Uh, you can think about these systems as being able to have um, essentially the ability to have something like the fluorescent emission, excitation emission spectrum that we had before, that was that heat map that I showed on the first slide, in, for every single spatial location in a two-dimensional image. So now we get both spatial information, excitation information, as well as emission information. And we can now image on a larger, wider field for, for things like small animals and so on. We also then have fiber-based systems uh, where we're now coupling um, these three excitation wavelengths into a single uh, multimode fiber. Um, and then that illuminates into the hydrogel that contains the carbon nanotubes, which then interface or interacts with the uh, nearby local environment. Uh, the carbon nanotubes fluoresce, and that light gets collected into this outer ring of collection fibers, uh, which then is piped and routed through a set of optical components here, and then focuses onto the uh, in-gas amplified photodetector. Uh, the first generation of this fiber optic probe uh, was done with one excitation fiber, one collection fiber, um, and we demonstrated here uh, using a calibration curve for our vitamin C and the detection of ascorbic acid. Um, the second generation uh, upgraded to that ring of six uh, light collection fibers around that single central light delivery fiber. Uh, it also incorporated the use of a sapphire half ball lens at the tip of it to improve the collection angle and efficiency of the near-infrared fluorescence from the carbon nanotube sensors. Um, then we tested this. This is the full system in its entirety, and we tested it in, in the various concentrations of single wall carbon nanotube solutions to uh, look at its response rate. Um, we then developed and 3D printed these molds um, that actually interface directly with the end of the fiber optic probe, as you can see here. Um, and these molds is what's going to house or encapsulate these hydrogels uh, that contain the nanosensors uh, encapsulated inside. Um, this system was demonstrated for a number of different sensors, as you can see here, for serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and hydrogen peroxide. And you can see that they give us very nice, distinct uh, response curve uh, that are specific to those analytes. Uh, so, as mentioned, you know, really our focus was to try and develop this technology for basically having a platform for real-time dynamic in vivo monitoring, in particular for key monitoring chemotherapeutic drug delivery, as well as monitoring the tumor response to treatment using hydrogen peroxide and nitrogen peroxide. So, in this uh, sensor we developed uh, for temozolomide, uh, we actually ended up developing the sensor for AIC. 
which is an inactive breakdown byproduct of temozolomide. Diazomethane is the active component uh, that's broken down from temozolomide to kill the cancer cell. When we mix the AIC directly with our sensor, we see immediate turn on response, as can be seen by this red line. And then when we mix it with temozolomide, uh, we see this uh, elongated response, mostly because what we're detecting here is the breakdown of temozolomide into AIC. So we're detecting the formation of AIC based on the half-life of temozolomide. The sensitivity detection uh, puts it at a range of five to 500 micromolar of AIC. Um, the way we do this sensor development is by first um, using a library of different wrappings around the carbon nanotubes, testing that against, in this case, AIC. Here we see that the GGGT3 is the most uh, sensitive to AIC. We then take this particular wrapping sensor and then screen it against a library of similarly structured uh, molecules to AIC and can continue to see the highest specificity is for AIC. We then uh, take a series of uh, time lapse of fluorescence excitation emission maps uh, to look at the chirality dependent changes. And you can see here that over time from 0 to 10 to 118 hours, we can see that the DNA wrap swims continue to increase in intensity in terms of the fluorescence emission upon prolonged exposure to temozolomide as it's forming and breaking down and forming AIC. We also have developed a sensor for our new TCAN. In this case, this is a wavelength shift sensor, as you can see here, uh, compared to the intensity uh, change-based sensors of AIC and Um And then we use our sensors for hydrogen peroxide here to determine the therapy efficacy of gemcitabine. Uh, here you can see longitudinal live animal imaging. Uh, this is the tumor site. Uh, before the initiation of gencytamine, this is after three treatments of gencytamine, and this is after two weeks of withdrawal of treatment of gencytamine. So before treatment, um, no hydrogen peroxide production. So Raman signal from uh, the, the sensor, the carbon nanotubes is still elevated. Um, upon treatment, hydrogen peroxide is produced or released into the extracellular space. So then the Raman signal intensity decreases. And then upon um, cessation of gensatomide, uh, there's no more new uh, production of hydrogen peroxide or release into the extracellular release space. And so the Raman intensity signals of the carbon nanotubes come back to normal. So I've shown you a platform for the development of nanosensors for diagnostics and biomonitoring, uh, capitalizing on the Kaufmore methodology, um, leveraging the hydrogel and optical imaging platforms so that combine leads to continuous in vivo measurement of biomarkers, and giving you hopefully um, a value proposition for the development of label-free nanosensor arrays for diagnostics and monitoring. In particular, future directions are going to fall in the categories of development of new sensors for drugs of interest and biomarkers, multiplexing of these sensors, leveraging hydrogels to improve sensitivity and specificity, uh, increase, continuing to develop low cost, portable, accessible optical imaging systems, as well as continuing to test and validate in increasingly complex biological materials. Of course, I'd like to thank the members of the Strano Research Group, in particular Professor Michael Strano and the Arnold Mabel Beckman Foundation for supporting this work, as well as JDRF, Amgen, NSF, and NIH in support of this work. So I want to shift um, quickly to some of the work that I've been doing recently in light of COVID-19, in particular in the evaluation of convalescent plasma or the passive transfer of antibodies from recently recovered patients to actively infected patients in the setting of COVID-19. In particular, finding that the maximal activity of neutralizing antibodies, the safety profile, and then the initial outcomes of this treatment. We found that the maximal neutralizing activity of these antibodies is peaks at the 31 to 35 days post-symptom onset of COVID-19. We found that a safety profile is mostly safe for transfusion in terms of looking at transfusion reactions from convalescent plasma, uh, with only 13% uh, re resulting in a change of signs or symptoms experienced by the patient during or shortly after the transfusion, with the vast majority, 76%, being due to the COVID-19 specifically, and only 24% of those uh, 55 uh, reactions to be due to the convalescent plasma. We found an increased transfusion reaction risk with uh, patients with blood group type B, as well as those with SOFA scores of 12 and 13. We did see a decreased risk with the age group of 80 to 89 years old. Overall, we see convalescent plasma as a safe therapeutic option from a transfusion reaction perspective in the setting of COVID-19. 
In the initial outcomes in severe and life-threatening COVID-19 hospital patients shows that convalescent plasma is potentially efficacious in uh, treatment for non-intubated patients. We also see improved survival curves for uh, patients that underwent convalescent plasma compared to a control group who did not. I'd like to thank the members of the Mount Sinai Department of Pathology, Molecular Cell Based Medicine, especially my co-residents, my tenant physician, and clinical mentors, the staff of the blood bank, as well as the collaborators of the New York State Department of Health, the New York Blood Center, and the rest of the Mount Sinai Health System Convalescent Plasma team. Thank you so much for your time and interest. <laughs>